Hello, everyone. Um, so today is Tuesday, January 16th. Um, we don't have class today. Uh, we don't have, well, KSU is closed today because of the winter weather. Um, and then tomorrow, Wednesday, January 17th, we are scheduled to have class. Um, but I'm afraid I am experiencing some health issues, so I'm going to be seeing a doctor tomorrow and will not be able to make it to class. Um, I should be able to make it, um, I'm hoping that I'll be back to normal activities by Friday and I'll see you in class on Friday. Um, so in lieu of class tomorrow, um, I will be posting this virtual lecture to take place, um, to take the place of tomorrow's in-person class. Okay, so um, the last time I saw you, which was, gosh, it was Friday, that was January 12th, um, we filled in a lot of these. We did function notation and we did evaluating functions. Um, so basically the word evaluate just means to um, plug something in and simplify it as well. Do any algebra or arithmetic necessary to simplify? So the word evaluate, anytime you see that, it means plug and simplify. Um, so we did several of these to get your brain ready for plugging in things that look a little scarier than just a number. Um, and again, you can do hard things. So take a deep breath. Yes, we can. Um, this is going to require your algebra pants. Um, the difference quotient for a function y equals f of x. Um, this is what we were building up to. Um, this difference quotient is going to um, really serve as the basis of Calc 1 when you get there. So the reason that we're practicing this right now is because um, the algebra part of this um, is going to be extremely important for you in Calc 1. Um, you'll understand, um, it'll, you'll kind of go through what exactly the difference quotient represents when you get to Calc 1, um, but really it's just the slope formula. Um, but today we are going, we're not really worried about what it represents. We're worried about the algebra part necessary to simplify it. That way when you get to Calc 1, you don't have to stress about what it means and how to simplify it. Hopefully the algebra simplification will be less scary and you'll be ready for it. So the difference quotient for a function y equals f of x is given by, um, I usually just um, shorten difference quotient to dq, and the difference quotient looks like this, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Um, now, again, I'm just asking you to hit the I believe button. Um, this is a, it's just a slope formula, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, but you'll figure that out in Calc 1. Um, we are just going to figure out how to deal with this notation and simplify it, right? Okay, so for each given function down here, y equals f of x, First, find f of x plus h, then evaluate and simplify the difference quotient. So I want you to do these problems in two pieces. Um, if you try to figure out what f of x plus h is while you're inside this huge um, fraction, you might get a little bit overwhelmed and start making mistakes. So what I want you to do is take it piece by piece. I want you to do just the f of x plus h part first. Then we'll plug everything into that big fraction and simplify the whole difference quotient. Okay, so let's try our first example here. f of x is equal to negative 3x squared plus 4x minus 2. All right, so before we jump right to the difference quotient, let's first find f of x plus h. Okay, f of x plus h. What on earth is this asking you to do? Well, this is function notation. It's a lot like what we did up here. When we had f of 1, what was this asking you to do? Well, you said, oh, well, f of x is right here. This thing says that x equals 1. This is telling me to plug 1 in for x into this function, right? All right. What we have down here is also just 
function notation. It's saying inside the function f, which is right here. I want to replace x with x plus h. I'm going to plug in x plus h for x everywhere. So let's go ahead and do that. So anywhere I see an x, I'm going to replace it with an x plus h. So I've got negative 3 times x, which I'm replacing with x plus h. Parentheses are your friend. Squared plus 4 times x, which I'm replacing with x plus h. Again, parentheses are your friend. Minus 2. So we've gone ahead and plugged x plus h in for x everywhere in this function. And again, you want to re replace it everywhere there's an x inside that function. Okay, now we simplify. All right, so to simplify, order of operations says we have to do the exponent first. This exponent right here says to square x plus h. Uh, how do I square x plus h? Well, that a square means you're going to take x plus h and multiply it by itself. So hopefully once we write it like this, this will jog some uh, memory here um, and we'll write it like this. Now from here, you might be wondering whether you should distribute the negative three first or FOIL first. I would strongly advise you to FOIL first. Um, you can really do either way. Um, but you're going to be confused about where to distribute the negative 3 into. Um, and there's only one negative 3, so you're only going to distribute it into one of your parentheses if you choose to do that first. Um, but I think that's going to be confusing, so I like to FOIL first. Okay, so I'm going to leave the negative 3 out here, and I'm going to FOIL first. I'm going to do first times first. x times x is x squared, plus my outside. So this was the first. Outside is x times h, which is xh, plus my inside, which is h times x. You can write that as hx, but I'm going to write it as another xh, because h times x is the same as x times h. And then I'm going to multiply the last, which is h times h. That's h squared. All right, so this is our FOIL. And then I'm going to go ahead and distribute this 4 while I'm here, plus 4x plus 4h minus 2. And then I'm going to take a quick shortcut here. I have some like terms in here. Let's go ahead and combine those. And I'm going to be lazy here and just do that inside this little parentheses here just to save some, some space. What is xh plus xh? Well, it's two xhs, right? Okay, so that simplifies a little bit in there. Um, and now we can distribute this negative 3 to each piece. So negative 3 times x squared is negative 3x squared. Negative 3 times 2xh is minus 6xh. And negative 3 times h squared is minus 3h squared. And then I still have these other things hanging out over here. Okay. And that's all I've got, right? Do I have any like terms that I can combine? I don't, right? This x squared doesn't, there's no more x squareds. I don't have any other xh's, no h squareds, no other x's, no other h's, and no other numbers. So this is the end of the line. This is f of x plus h. Okay, so now we know what f of x plus h is. Now let's come back to the difference quotient. So the difference quotient is f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. All right, now we just found that, I'm going to switch colors here again. Let's do, let's do green. f of x plus h, this thing right here, we just found that this was all of this stuff. So I'm going to take all of this and I'm going to plug it in for f of x plus h. So let's go ahead and plug that in. f of x plus h is negative 3x squared minus 6xh minus 3h squared 
plus 4x plus 4h minus 2. I know that's long and annoying. This is not a place um, to get lazy. Make sure that you plug these in correctly. Um, when you're simplifying, I take little lazy steps like this sometimes. Um, that's okay because it's it's um, it doesn't cause me to get completely lost in what I'm doing. Um, if you don't take your time and put all of this in correctly in the right spot, you might lose track of what you're doing and where things go, and you need every single one of these in the right place. So take your time. This is not a place to take shortcuts, so be careful with that. Okay, so that is f of x plus h. Now we have to do minus f of x. What's f of x? Oh, f of x was up here. So I am going to take negative 3x squared plus 4x minus 2 and plug it in for f of x. And again, parentheses are your friend. We are subtracting the whole function. So I'm going to subtract f of x is negative 3x squared plus 4x minus 2. And all of this is over h. Okay, we have just plugged in. We plugged everything into the difference quotient. Now we have to simplify this bad boy. Okay, so let's start. Um, so we do parentheses first, right? So there's really nothing to simplify inside these. I don't have anything to distribute. Nothing simplifies. These parentheses aren't doing much, so we can get rid of them. Okay, so I'm just going to get rid of them and copy this all down. 3h squared plus 4x plus 4h minus 2. And then I need to subtract all of this. So to get rid of these parentheses, I need to distribute this negative 1. So when I distribute that negative 1, I get plus 3x squared minus 4x plus 2. And all of this is over h. Okay, so we've simplified inside our parentheses. Um, now let's see if we can combine like terms. I don't have any other multiplication left, so let's do our addition and subtraction from left to right. Do we have anything that we can add or subtract like terms? All right, I see an x squared and an x squared. I see an x and an x. I think this is from the mailman. Okay, thank you, sweetheart. Because you gave him cookies. Okay, thank you, well, mom. You're a mailman. I agree. Thank you, sweetheart. Okay, and then, sorry, my my children are also home on the uh, snow day as well. So that was my daughter. Um, and then the last thing that we have to combine here is our numbers. We've got a negative 2 and a plus 2, so we can combine all of these guys. Now, what do you notice when you do this? Negative 3x squared plus 3x squared. That's 0. These guys cancel. How about 4x minus 4x? That's 0. Those cancel. How about negative 2 and plus 2? Again, those cancel. So all of those things are gone. So what do we have left up here? I'm going to do it over here because I'm running out of room. I've got negative 6xh. I've got a minus 3h squared. And I've got plus 4h left up here. Sorry that's so squished, but I want to make sure I have time, I have space to finish this out. And then I have an h down here. Okay. Now, it might feel like we're done simplifying, but when you get to calculus, you aren't going to be done simplifying until this h on the bottom goes away. You need to cancel the h on the bottom. Now, what do you notice about everything on top? Everything on top has an h in it. That's how you know you didn't screw it up. If you have something without an h left up here, um, you messed something up, go back and check your work. Um, so. If, I have, if everything up here has an h in it, I can factor it out. So I'm going to take an h out. And what do you get when you take an h out of everything up here? Well, if I take an h out of this guy, I get negative 6x. If I take an h out of this guy, I get negative 3h. I did not leave myself enough space here. And then if I take an h out of this, I get plus 
4. So when I factor an h out on top, I get h times the quantity negative 6 minus 3h plus 4. That looks good to me. All over h. Now I have an h on top connected only by multiplication. I have an h on the bottom not connected to anything else. These bad boys can cancel. The h on the bottom is gone, and what I'm left with is negative 6x minus 3h plus 4. Your answer here can have x's, it can have h's, it can have both. Um, sometimes you'll have just x's, sometimes you'll have just h's, most of the time you'll have both. Okay. All right, so that was the difference quotient. So algebraic fortitude, take um, small steps here. I want you to do f of x plus h first, then come to the difference quotient and plug it in. Um, take your time, algebraic fortitude. Yes, you can. We are building your tolerance um, for annoying problems here. And everybody has to do annoying things, right? You got to do taxes. So this is a life skill. <laughs> so um, embrace it, fight through it. You can do this. Okay, next one we want to do is this guy. f of x equals 4 over x plus 6. Okay, so if this is our function, again, the first thing that we're going to do is find f of x plus h. Okay. Again, what does this notation mean? I'm plugging in x plus h. You got it. So I'm going to go to my function up here, and anywhere I see an x, I'm going to replace it with x plus h. So I'm going to have 4 over, instead of x, I have x plus h, and then I'm going to have that plus 6 here. Again, parentheses are your friend here. Um, but in this case, these parentheses don't really do much. So to simplify this, those parentheses don't do anything. I can just get rid of them. This is what my function looks like. No simplification, no like terms, no canceling. That's all she wrote. I cannot cancel the 4 and the 6 or simplify the 4 over 6 because this 6 is attached by addition, and addition and subtraction ruin everything good in algebra. You can only cancel things connected by multiplication. Okay, so in this case, what we do now that we have f of x plus h is we go to our difference quotient. Our difference quotient looks like f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. All right, f of x plus h, we have that. We just found that. That's this guy. I'm going to plug it in. So f of x plus h is 4 over x plus h plus 6. f of x is my original function here. I'm going to take that and plug it in. So I'm going to subtract 4 over x plus 6 all over h. Okay, now we have to simplify this. <sighs> this is a complex fraction. I have fractions within fractions. I got to get one fraction on the top, one fraction on the bottom. I already have one fraction on the bottom, that's just h over 1, but I've got two fractions on the top, so I have to combine them. To combine or subtract fractions here, we need to get a common denominator. So what is our common denominator up here? You might be tempted to say x plus h plus 6, but again, we have to get to our common denominator with multiplication. I can't multiply x plus 6 by anything, right? Multiply it to get x plus h plus 6. In that case, what I have to do is just multiply my denominators. So my LCD here is going to be my first one, x plus h plus 6 times x plus 6, my second denominator. This whole thing is my least common denominator. I know it's ugly. It's okay. Take a deep breath. This is going to be great. Now we have to get a common denominator for these guys. So we're going to multiply each of these guys by a form of 1. Um, to get to our common denominator. Let your denominators lead the way. What is this guy missing from your common denominator? What do you need to multiply it by? It's missing the x plus 6. So I'm going to multiply by x plus 6 on the bottom, and that means I have to multiply by x plus 6 on the top. How about this guy? What is this missing? 
Well, x plus 6 is missing the x plus h plus 6. So I'm going to multiply by x plus h plus 6 on the top and the bottom. You got to multiply on the bottom to get your common denominator. You got to multiply on top, so you multiply by a form of 1, and you don't change your value of your, of your fraction here. All right, so when we do this, when I multiply on top, I'm going to go ahead and distribute here, and we get 4x plus 4h up here on top, all over that common denominator. I'm going to leave this multiplied out. x plus h plus 6 times x plus 6. Um, the reason that I'm not going to multiply that out is, one, because there's a lot of distribution here, and it's a big opportunity for error, and I'm not entirely sure I'm going to need to do it. So in this case, I'm going to leave it like this until I know for 100% sure that I need to multiply it out. So I'm just going to leave it for right now. And then to multiply this guy out, I'm going to distribute here, and I'm going to get 4x plus 4h plus 24 all over my common denominator of x plus 6 times x plus h plus 6. Okay, I've got all of that over h over 1. Now I've got a common denominator up here. I can subtract my numerators and keep my common denominator. So when I do that, you have to subtract this whole numerator. Make sure you distribute the negative and subtract the whole thing. So we are going to get 4x plus 4h, this guy, minus 4x minus 4h minus 24. Because when I subtract this entire thing, I distribute that negative. So I just subtracted my numerators. I'm going to keep that lovely common denominator down here. And then all over h over 1. I am very close. Um, I've got one fraction on top, one fraction on the bottom. Before we keep change flip, let's see if we can simplify up top here. Um, so what do we have here? Well, did I, I'm thinking I missed something here. Let me just double check. Oh, yep, I did. So this was, it was right here. Sorry, I don't have y'all in class to help fix me here. This was not an H. This was a 6, right? I wrote it so poorly that I couldn't read it. This is a 6, not an H. So when I distribute that 4 down here, I get 4X. That's okay. But I don't get 4H. This guy is not right instead of 4h, I'm going to get 24, because this is a 6, not an h. That was my fault. Sorry for the confusion here, y'all. Hopefully, if you caught that before, hopefully you stuck to your guns and you fixed it. Okay, so now I have 4x. This is a 24. That's my first one. And then I distributed that negative, and I'm good there. Okay. I'll show, you, I'll show you in a second why I knew that I screwed up and why I went back to check my work. So even I make mistakes, right? I've been doing this for a really long time, longer than I'd like to uh, admit. Um, but even I make mistakes sometimes. And I'll show you how I knew to go back and find my mistake. So what, what, uh, what combines here? What simplifies? Well, we've got some like terms on top. I have a 4x here and a 4x here. And I've got a number here and a number here, so let's combine those. What's 4x minus 4x? Oh, that's 0. Those cancel. What's 24 minus 24? 0. Those cancel. Okay. Now, look at what we have left on top. We have negative 4h. Just like up here, after you combined like terms, I told you everything up here had to have an h in it. If it didn't, if everything didn't have an h in it after you canceled, you screwed up. When I originally had a 4h here, I had a 24 left here that did not 
have an H in it. That's how I knew that I screwed up and I went back to check my work and I said, oh, something is not right here. Let me go back and figure it out. So um, when you cancel like terms, even on a problem that looks like this, everything up here after you combine like terms needs to have an H in it. If it doesn't, go back and find the mistake and fix it and then you'll be on your way. So now everything up here has an H in it. I feel confident about this. We are rocking and rolling. Um, and I'm really sorry about the confusion, but you know, even I do it sometimes. So good lesson. All right. So now we've got a negative four H on top and then this lovely common denominator. That's our fraction up top divided by H over one. I've got one fraction on top, one fraction on bottom. I'm going to keep the fraction on top. I'm going to change this giant division bar to multiplication, and I'm going to flip the fraction on the bottom. So you're going to keep, you're going to change, you're going to flip. Multiply the top by the reciprocal of the bottom. Now, when you multiply, you're going to multiply straight across. So I'm just going to kind of combine those here. Um, I have an H on top connected only by multiplication to other things. I have an H on the bottom connected only by multiplication to other things. They go away. And I am left with negative 4 over x plus 6 times x plus h plus 6. And this is my final version of my um, difference quotient. Now, um, here, um, I'm not going to still not going to multiply out the denominator. It doesn't really help us right now. So just go ahead and leave that. Um, and again, our goal here was to get that initial H on the bottom to cancel. The initial H on the bottom was this guy right here, which was this one right here. It canceled. That's when we're done. This is our final answer and you can put a box around it and walk away and move on with your life. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. That is the difference quotient. Um, again, you guys are going to find out a lot more about this guy um, in Calc 1. But for now, we're going to practice the algebra of simplifying it. That way you don't have to digest the meaning and the algebra all in Calc 1. You can do hard things. You've got this. Fight through it. We're building algebraic fortitude. Um, all right. So next thing that we're going to do um, is analyzing graphs. Um, first thing, that we're, so we're going to switch to a little bit of graphing. Um, first thing that we're going to do is just look at a graph and answer some questions about it. Um, so first, I just want to kind of go over what a positive function value and a negative function value mean. Um, a positive function value. When I say function value, I mean a positive f of x. But f of x means y. So what this really means is I want a positive y value. A function value means the output of your function. It's a y value. Okay, so what does that look like on a graph? Where is y positive on a graph? Well, y is positive above the x-axis, right? Y is positive anywhere above here. So on a graph, this is going to be where your graph is above the x-axis. That's what it means to have a positive function value or a positive y value. Your graph's above the x-axis. Similarly, if you have a negative function value, function value means y. This means a negative y value. And where is y negative? Well, y is negative below the x-axis. So what it looks like on a graph is wherever your graph is below the x-axis, because that is where y is negative. That doesn't look like a y, and that bothers me. So my, uh, there we go. OCD wants to make that a little nicer. Okay, so that's what we mean by a positive or negative function value. All right, so let's let's try this. Okay, I want to 
use this graph that I'm given. This is a, y, a graph of y equals f of x. I'm not really sure what function this is, but we called it f. Is f of 1 positive? Okay, f of 1. This is the function value. The y value, where x equals 1. f of 1 is y, where x equals 1. It's the y value wherever x equals 1. So where is x equal to 1? Well, x equals 1 is right here. What's the y value that goes with x equals 1? Well, it is right here. This is the point, right? The y value there is negative 2. Okay, so f of 1 is negative 2. That's my function value there. Is negative 2 positive? Nope, that is negative. So our answer here is just no. All right, try the next two and see if that makes sense. I want you to work, pause the video, work through B and C real quick for me, and then once you're done, go ahead and hit play. All right, hopefully you've had a chance to do that. Let's look through these guys. Is F of negative three positive? Okay, again, f of negative 3, this is a function value. That means a y value. And it's going to be the y where x is negative 3. So what's the y value where x is negative 3? Okay, x is negative 3 here. So our y value is right up here. It's 2. y equals 2. Okay, f of negative 3 is 2. So is 2 positive? Why, yes it is. So the answer to this guy is yes. All right, how about f of zero? f of zero means the y value where x equals zero. Okay, where x equals zero, x equals zero is here. Our y value is down here. It's, uh, I don't know, negative 1.2-ish, right? We're just eyeballing it, it doesn't have to be perfect. Is that negative? Is negative 1.2 negative? Yes, it sure is. It is below the x-axis. It's not perfect, but that's okay. It's close enough to know, to be able to answer the question. Okay, great. So now, for which values of x is f of x equal to zero? Okay, this is a little different than what we did before. Is this saying that x equals zero and asking us for y? No, f of x, this means y. This says that y equals zero and it's asking me for x. So where y is zero, what is x? I'm gonna switch colors here for a second. Where is y equal to zero? Well, y equals zero right here. And I want my x value, so I'm going to go sideways here along y equals 0. And I want to know what x values I hit. I hit it right here. And I have a point right here, and I have a point right here. So I actually have an x value of negative 4, an x value of negative 1, and an x value of 2. So all of those x values are where f of x or y is equal to 0. Okay, next one. For which values of x is f of x? Again, f of x means y. For which values of x is y less than or equal to zero? Okay, where is y less than or equal to zero? Well, if y is less than zero, that means we're below the x-axis. So the parts of this graph that are below the x-axis that's okay, I'll stay with red R. This part, this is below the x-axis. And this part is below the x-axis, right? These are the two parts of my graph that are below the x-axis. So anything in there will work. So which x values does that apply to? We're basically going to find the domain of just these two little sections. So the domain of this first section here is from negative 5 to negative 4. So we're going to go from negative 5 to negative 4. Do we include our endpoints? Well, we definitely include this one because y is less than 0 there, and that works. So we're going to include that one. And then how about this one? 
y is equal to zero there. Does that work? Yes, zero equals zero. We're good there. And then I'm going to union that with any x values in here, which this guy covers anything from negative one all the way up to two. And again, our y values at both of these are equal to zero and a y value equal to zero, zero equals zero, that works. So I'm going to include those endpoints. All right, last one here. For which values of x is f of x greater than zero? All right, I want you to pause the video again and um, try this one yourself. Hit play when you're ready. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to try this one. For which values of x is y greater than zero? Well, y is greater than zero wherever your graph is above the x-axis. My graph is above the x-axis here, all the way in here, and here. Right? Okay. So now we basically have to find all of the x values that these cover. I'm finding the domain of these two pieces. Um, this first bit on the left covers anywhere from here, which is negative 4, up to here, which is negative 1. So we go from negative 4 to negative 1. Do we include those guys? Well, at negative 4 and negative 1, our y value is equal to 0. Does a y value of 0 work here? Is 0 strictly greater than 0? No, that's not true. There's no little equal to sign. So these are parentheses. And then I'm going to union this with all of the x values here, which this guy covers anywhere from 2 to 4. OK. My y value, we got to be careful here. My y value at 2 is 0. Again, we said that 0 is not greater than 0. That one doesn't work. We don't want to include that. How about at 4? The y value at 4 is up here at 1. Is 1 greater than 0? Yes. This one works. So I'm going to include 4, even though there's no little equal to sign, because my y value at 4 is above the x-axis. So I'm going to include that one, even though I didn't include the other ones because they had a y value of zero, which did not work. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so that's how we answer questions about these graphs. And then I've got one last thing for you here. Um, so the very last thing I have for you um, in our module one homework is graphing piecewise functions. Um, hopefully this is something that you have seen before, um, but our um, our graphs are going to be a little bit more complicated. Um, now, unfortunately, since I won't be in class tomorrow, um, I won't be there to pass out a, a handout that I have for you, kind of reminding you of what our basic graphs look like and transformations of them and how they work. Um, I'm going to be posting that in the Homework 1 resources folder along with this video. So if you do not remember how to graph our basic functions, um, I want to refer you to that handout to remember how to graph our basic functions. Um, so that'll be available for you to help with that. Okay, so graphing piecewise functions. The way that this works is I want you to graph each piece of your function on its own graph. So each piece gets its own graph. Now, what I mean by each piece, if we look at this um, piecewise function down here, notice I've got one piece here, one piece here, and one piece here. Each line of this is basically its own piece. So this means that to start out with this, I'm making three graphs to start with. Each piece gets its own graph. This has three pieces. I'm going to be making three graphs. And then after you graph each function on its own graph, then what I want you to do is cut out the correct section of each graph. 
based on the x values of that piece. This should make a little bit more sense later, but we are going to cut out just a little piece of each graph based on the x values. So when I say based on the x values, let's look at this function down here again. So this first piece up here, this says that my function f of x, which is y, equals 6, right? This function is going to look like y equals 6, but only if x is less than negative 4. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the graph of y equals 6, which we will have graphed in, in part, like in, um, in, uh, on our, in step 1. There we go. Um, and then we are going to cut out the part where x is less than negative 4. That's what I mean by based on the x values. This x less than 4 tells us what part of the graph we're going to cut out to take with us. And then once we've identified which section of each graph to cut out, you are going to make one final graph. Um, that includes all cut out sections together on one graph. I like to call these guys Frankenstein functions. The reason that I call these Frankenstein functions is that we are cutting out a section, we're cutting out a part of a bunch of different graphs. We're going to take them home. We're going to sew them together and we are going to make a monster graph. And that monster graph is our masterpiece, right? That is our final answer. Um, so I like to call these guys Frankenstein functions because we are cutting out pieces of other graphs and sewing them together in a lovely monster graph. Okay, so that's kind of how this is going to work. And we're also going to have to answer if a function is continuous. Now, a function is continuous if it is all one piece. That means it's not broken into pieces. Um, you can draw the whole thing without lifting your pencil. There's no holes, there's no asymptotes, there's no breaks, there's nothing that breaks this thing into pieces. It is all connected. All right, so let's do this. I want to graph the piecewise function f of x. That means y equals 6, only if x is less than negative 4. And y equals negative 10 plus x squared, but only if x is between negative 4 and 4. Note we include negative 4 here, but not 4. And y equals 2x minus 3, but only if x is greater than 4. All right, we said that we have three pieces here. So step one, we are making three graphs. So I'm going to make three graphs here. Sorry, they got a little bigger as I went. I tried to make them all the same size, but nobody's perfect. Okay, so the first one we're going to graph here is y equals 6, my first function. This middle one, I'm going to graph y equals negative 10 plus x squared. And this last one, I'm going to graph y equals 2x minus 3. All right, now let's remember what these look like. Um, y equals 6. This is a line. And this is a line where every y value on this line is 6. So this is a horizontal line through 6. This is what y equals 6 looks like. All right. Now this middle one, y equals negative 10 plus x squared. This is going to take an x squared graph. And x squared, this is a back pocket function. I call them back pocket functions. Um, those are the ones that I need you to know what they look like without thinking too much about it x squared looks like a u. And this negative 10 here is going to move that u down 
10 units. And again, I have a handout um, on D2L to help you with this. Um, and I'll give you a hard copy once I get back on Friday so that you'll have it for the rest of the semester as well to help you. Um, but you won't have it on a test, mind you. So you are going to have to kind of remember how this stuff works. So uh, negative 10 is down here. And x squared looks like this, right? Okay. Not perfect, but that's the general shape of this. It's an x squared graph, just slid down 10 units. So it's going to look something like that. And then y equals 2x minus 3. What does this look like? This is a line. This is y equals mx plus b. This is a line with a slope of 2 and a y-intercept of 0, negative 3. That's what this b value does, this negative 3. That tells you your y-intercept. Okay, so this is a line. How do you graph a line? Well, you start at your y-intercept of 0, negative 3, and then you use your slope. Remember that your slope means rise over run. But this isn't a fraction. Let's write 2 as a fraction. That's 2 over 1. That's our rise over our run. Okay, so that means from my y-intercept of negative 3, I'm going to rise 2 and run 1. You always run to the right if it's positive. So rise 2, run 1 to the right. And you can do this as many times as you want to get some good points. You can rise two, oops, from here. Rise two more, run one. And we'll get some points. You can go the other way. You can go down two and left one. You can go backwards. And we've got some points here. And here's what. Pretend that that's perfectly straight and goes through all those points, right? Use your imagination for me. I'll do the same for you, I promise. Um, this is the line y equals 2x minus 3. Okay. All right, so we've graphed all of our functions. That's step one. We've graphed them all on its own graph. Now we have to cut out the correct section of each graph. Okay, I'm gonna switch colors for this. Let's go to this green. All right, so y equals six. We only want the function y equals six if x is less than negative four. Okay, where is x less than negative 4? Well, x equals negative 4 is over here somewhere. Wherever we're less than negative 4 is not at here. We're not going to include this part, but we want anything less than negative 4. So it's going to be anything over there. That's where x is less than 4, or sorry, negative 4, right? So the part of the function that's to that side is right here. And I want everything up to this dotted line, but not including it. So I'm going to put an open circle here because I do not have an equal to sign. So that means this is an open circle. And what are the coordinates of that open circle? That's going to help us put all of our cutout sections on the same graph. Well, that is the point. Negative 4, 6, right? My x coordinate is negative 4. My y coordinate is 6. Okay, so I'm going to go from negative 4. 6 to the left. Great. Now let's move to the middle one. I want y equals negative 10 plus x squared, but only if x is between negative 4 and 4. Okay. Negative 4 to 4. Well, negative 4, I don't know, it's over here somewhere. And 4 is over here somewhere. And so I want everything between negative 4 and 4. Now, I want to include negative 4. I do not want to include positive 4. But I want everything in between. Okay, so I want everything from this point. Because we include it, it's going to be a closed point. And here, because this is not included, I'm going to put an open circle where this hits it. And I'm going to include everything in between. Okay, now this is going to be a lot easier to put on our graph later once we know what the ordered pairs of each of these is. 
Okay, I know that the x coordinate here is negative four. How do I know the y value? Well, if you have an x value, you plug it in to find y. So when I take negative four and plug it into my function, I get negative 10 plus negative four squared. Negative four squared is positive 16. Negative 10 plus 16, that's a six. And then this guy over here, I know my x coordinate is a positive four. I'm going to find my y the same way. I'm going to plug it in. I'm going to get negative 10 plus four squared, which is negative 10 plus 16, which gets me back to six again. Okay, cool. So that's the section of this middle graph that I'm going to cut out. And then finally, on my last graph over here, I want y equals 2x minus 3, but only if x is greater than or equal to 4. 4 is over here somewhere, and I want to include everything greater than or equal to 4. So I'm going to include this and anything over here. So I want a solid dot here and anything this way, right? Okay, what is this ordered pair? I know x is 4. To get y, I plug it into my function, which is this guy. So I'm going to get y equals 2 times 4 minus 3. 8 minus 3 is 5. This is the ordered pair for 5. Now, I know that we are pretty much done on time. I just want to finish this problem, and then we are all done. I'm going to take all of these cutout sections home and sew them together on my monster graph. I'm gonna take this section over here. I'm gonna start at negative four, four, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, negative four, six. I'm gonna put an open dot there and I'm gonna to go to the left, right? That is this section put on this graph. And then I'm gonna take this section and put it on this graph as well. I'm gonna go from the point negative four, six, negative four, six. That's the same as this open circle. This guy needs a closed circle there, so I'm just going to put a closed circle on top of an open circle and note that it just fills it in. I'm going to go all the way down to negative 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I've got a point here, and then I come all the way back to 1, 2, 3, 4, 6 with an open circle here, and I'm going to connect them with a parabola. That's this section on this graph. And then finally, I'm going to put a closed dot at 4, 5 and put a line with a slope of 2. So I'm going to start at 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's right here. And I'm going to go up to over 1. And I'm going to fill in that line. This is that section, this section up here on this graph. And this is my completed graph. This is my Frankenstein function. This is what we look like. Are we continuous? Is this all one piece? Well, this section, this, this dot right here connects these two pieces, so those guys are good. But notice it's broken right here. That means that we are not continuous. We are broken. Okay, so I'm sorry that I had to do this virtually, um, but hopefully this allows you to watch the sections of the video that you need a little bit more closely. Um, let me know if you have any questions and start working on module one homework if you have not already. If you've not already started it, you need to get going on it. You got a lot of work to do. Um, and again, I'm going to post the um, function graphs um, handout for you in D2L to help you with these guys. Um, hopefully I'll see you on Friday in class. Let me know if you have any questions. Have a lovely Wednesday.